Good afternoon and welcome to um, the first event in the Lent term of um, LSE South Asia Center. Uh, we're delighted to, to start with uh, yet another episode of Tough Talk today on does liberalism allow populism? Uh, for those of you who have attended our earlier ones, you would know that uh, the title of the Tough Talk is always presented as a question and therefore we always try and bring together a panel of speakers who will present divergent views on, on the same, same question. Um, for those uh, who did actually read the concept note, I do want to say, since I've had several emails since this was advertised, that the word allow, i.e. does liberalism allow populism, uh, was used in a particular way, which is that what we are trying to interrogate and investigate in today's event is to actually see whether liberalism, which is the focus of today's discussion, creates intentionally, unintentionally, or even through its evolution over centuries, decades, centuries, and even conceptually, does it create spaces inadvertently um, for various other kinds of uh, systems of governance to emerge, uh, ideologies to emerge, uh, which may not necessarily appear to be liberal to those who consider themselves to be on the classical side of, of liberalism. Uh, a lot of this will get clarified in the course of the events, but without further ado, if I may uh, begin with now introducing all the panelists and um, before that, I think I should introduce myself. Uh, my name is Nilanjan Sarkar. I'm Deputy Director of the LSE South Asia Center. Thank you everyone for joining us today live on Facebook. You can send us questions either directed to an individual speaker or to um, the entire panel if you want on Facebook and we will ask them at regular intervals um, to the speakers. Um, it is my pleasure first to introduce Michael Frieden, who is now em Emeritus Professor at Oxford at Mansfield College and was formerly and for the longest time, uh, even in the short time that I spent at Oxford, uh, was director of the Center for Political Ideologies. And that was the reason I was very keen to have Professor Frieden here. Um, he has written extensively uh, on, on the topic of liberalism, but for those of you who might not still have read it, I would still suggest that you go back to 1978 and read The New Liberalism and Ideology of Social Reform, which will come up, he's, he's, he's smiling as I say it, but it will come up in, in the course of my discussion. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very, very fantastic read. Um, Harsh Madhusudan and Rajiv Mantri, are co-authors of A New India of India, uh, A New Idea of India, I beg your pardon, Individual Rights in a Civilizational State. In their daytime, both of them describe themselves on the website as investors of two different types. Hush is a public markets investor and Rajiv invests in public companies and early stage technology ventures. I'm delighted that they've both joined us today. I got in touch with them a long time ago when I read their book. Uh, I'm also very, very lucky that they both have studied in the United States uh, because uh, United States is going to come up, the liberalism of the United States is going to come up in, in our discussion today. And they have been there and have experienced it in a way that let's say I haven't because I have actually never studied in the United States. Uh, Akash Singh Rathor is permanent visiting professor at Lewis University in Rome and currently is visiting professor at the Royal University of Law and Economics at Phnom Penh in Cambodia and joins us from Phnom Penh today. Um, Akash has recently published from OUP, I think it's five volumes of an anthologies of, of Ambedkar's writings. Uh, but in 2019, uh, Akash uh, published an edited volume called Vision for a Nation, Parts and Perspectives, uh, which was one of the several reasons why I invited uh, Akash today. Uh, Akash is a political philosopher uh, by training. Helena Rosenblatt uh, was the first person to answer to my invitation. Helena is professor at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York and is the author of The Lost History of Liberalism from Ancient Rome to the 21st Century, which is from Princeton University Press and was, I think, published in 2018, if I uh, remember correctly. Um, it's a fascinating overview, a historical overview, overview, wonderful for someone like me 
who uh, is a student of history uh, about, about a political concept, because my own research is, is on justice and ideas of justice. So it, I found it very, very interesting to read. Last, but definitely not the least, Shashi Tharoor is member of parliament, the Indian National Congress in Tiruvannantapuram uh, in Kerala. And his re most recent publication is The Battle of Belonging on nationalism, patriotism, and what it means to be Indian. Thank you very much, everyone. Welcome to uh, the LSE South Asia Center and to today's event. Um, we are going to start with uh, asking Harsh and Rajiv to uh, present some initial remarks about their books. Uh, we've agreed that they'll speak between eight and 10 minutes and then uh, Shashi will speak. So uh, if I could just request the others to keep their mics on mute and Harsh, you're going to speak first. So if you wouldn't mind starting um, and you have between the two of you, you have 10 minutes, so take five and stop. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nilanjan. It's my honor along with my co-author Rajiv to be part of this August panel. Uh, without wasting too much time, I'll get directly into it. Uh, the name of our book is A New Idea of India, a, uh, not the, uh, and the subtitle is Individual Rights in a Civilizational State. Um, you know, individual rights generally connotes or denotes liberalism, part of uh, the topic today, and civilizational state, some would say, is either directly or a dog whistle for populism, as some might define it. And the way we kind of square the circle is by saying the two are not actually orthogonal to each other. And actually the Indian mind, the dharmic mind is all about synthesis. So I'll delve deeper into both uh, quickly and Raji will go more into details, but there are five broad theses that we basically speak about in the book, which uh, quite conveniently correspond to the five chapters. The first is that India is an ancient civilization and it's not a post-colonial entity. It is of course also a post-colonial entity, but it is an ancient civilization. The second thesis, um, is that this ancient civilization, which a lot of people deny, uh, both during British colonial times, as well as some modern day Indians, is now or has been transforming into a nation, a coherent nation through the Aegis, the instrumentality of a democratic state. So it's important to kind of separate civilization and now becoming a coherent nation. Um, the third thesis is that individual rights are what we should be looking at and not group rights. We should be looking as people as individual Indians and not as, as far as the state is concerned, uh, a member of a particular religion or after enough of a time sunset clause members of this or that caste or that region. The fourth thesis, individual rights as applied to economics is that with some due exceptions for industrial or trade policy, we should broadly have competitive capitalism while having an efficient welfare state. And finally, speaking of state, we need to distinguish between state and society. India is transforming into a nation through a civilization through more and more of a competent state, which can see individual Indians. And therefore, individual Indians are breaking out of their caste and community barriers. They're urbanizing, they're moving all around the country and that process gets accelerated. It becomes a snowball. Um, so let's come back to the subtitle, individual rights in a civilizational state. Let's take the first, uh, let's take the second first, civilizational state. So India is a distinct civilization from the West. India is not kind of a mimic man, a minnow of the West. India is, India's population together is that of Latin America, North America, rather South America, North America, and Europe put together. And the best way to summarize, if there is one word which summarizes the Indian civilization, uh, we would argue it is the word dharma. The word dharma is much broader than religion. Um, you know, in fact, a scholar such as Jan Asman, who talks about the mosaic paradox, the mosaic distinction, says, the, and he also writes about the invention of religion, we have to distinguish between uh, monotheisms, especially proselytizing monotheisms, and Eastern religions, which are much more rooted in a particular culture. And if they are universalist, they're not homogenizing the universal. So if, if, for example, China had more of a different history or a background or more, Christian and Muslim populations, we would all be talking about perhaps a Chinese religion called Hanism. So the Hinduism has to be seen very differently in that context. Um, so what is the civilizational state in, in the case of India? Uh, Indian states are like different countries in the West. 
Um, and even if you look at the state, for example, in England, um, you know, the, you, they have individual rights. They have the same laws for everybody, but that does not prevent them from having an Anglican church which is a state church. The head of the state of England is also the head of the Anglican church. We have life peers in the House of Lords who are from that church. And nobody goes out saying that the UK is communal or fascist. Um, so it's important to understand what is this civilization that's India and what is so distinct about it. Um, basically, it, dharma represents the original multiculturalism. It is small m multiculturalism in the sense that, you know, just like the Greeks and the Roman, the Greco-Roman religion would take an Egyptian deity like Isis, and that would be worshipped in Roman Britain because of the synthesis, this assimilation, but two-way assimilation, two-way integration. Hinduism has done that with Vedic, pre-Vedic, non-Vedic religions, like going from Puri in South India to North India. And that, that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of religion, uh, that kind of thing that we now call religion because we have to compare it to Islam and Christianity becomes a source of much confusion. Um, so it, it's important to keep that in mind that the Indian, when, when the, when the so-called Indian right, and we think the terms right and left in India make really no sense. Like we have to talk in terms of, you know, whether we are part of one civilization, uh, people who recognize India as a civilizational entity and those who do not. Uh, so in, in that context, it's important to understand because the history of partition, as people who know, India was divided into two countries and later on three countries uh, on the basis of religion. And that's why there are two Punjabs. There's one Punjab in India, there's one Punjab in Pakistan, there's one Bengal in India, there's one Bengal in East Pakistan that later became Bangladesh. And there is absolutely no demand whatsoever from either of the Punjabs or either of the Bengals to join together. On the other hand, the Jammu region, or Kashmir is a bit of an exception we can discuss, and Tamil Nadu are very happily together. So you have to be an academic to not see that the Hindu dharmic core of Indian nationalism. Now, of course, uh, it is the failure of people who call themselves uh, the flag bearers of civic nationalism or constitutional patriotism that they have not been able to define a state with individual rights. For example, Indian Muslim men can marry four wives uh, Indian men, Hindu men, if they marry more than one wife, they're jailed. And when so people talk about having the same equal laws for everybody, just like we have in Australia or America, people would start saying, well, the Muslim community's laws don't bother you. But to me and Rajiv, that is the soft bigotry of low expectations. Either we are fellow citizens or we are not fellow citizens. Um, either, either, either we are as part of Ottoman millets or we are part of a modern nation, all of us in, in it together. And finally, this nation, what India is going through, actually Europe will go through very soon. India is actually the forerunner of the European Union. I mean, and God bless the little English hearts. They had a, they had a role to play in the creation of both uh, by actually you know, unifying and making them coherent. Uh, in India, through the case of colonialism, uh, basically Indian nationalism, uh, both Hindu and so-called secular is in contradistinction to British colonialism and Muslim Turkic colonialism. And the European Union will now cohere, cohere because the British have finally left um, and thereby, you know, not achieving their one single aim of foreign policy that the continent should never unite. Uh, so in, in many ways, uh, you know, we are seeing the growth of civilizational states around the world um, with the West being much more dominant and having both European Union, United States and other countries as part of that civilization of the West. We never actually interrogate the, the category, the West, uh, that is assumed to be a given, but somehow India being a civilization is, is considered to be controversial. So just to, before I hand over to Raji very quickly, we don't think individual rights that a small L or classical liberalism is in any way orthogonal to uh, an explicit civilizational understanding of the Indian nation state project, which is basically a continuation of the ancient Indian civilization. Rajiv. Thank you, Harsh. Thank you for that uh, overview on the book and on India that is Bharat as a dharmic polity and civilization state. Uh, like Harsh said, very pleased and honored to be on this August panel uh, with the eminent professors and with Shashi. So I will now shift gears and move to a discussion on some specific policies and events in three key areas where our book, A New Idea of India, critiques the old Nehruvian way and offers a new path for building a secure, egalitarian and prosperous India for all citizens. So first, let's talk about secularism, or more correctly, as we write in the book, pseudo-secularism. 
as harsh indicated there are severe problems with how secularism has come to be practiced in india indeed as we comprehensively document in the book it is a fraud on the people of india because secularism today means electoral bribery by the creation of religion specific welfare schemes discrimination based on religion is not secularism so this pseudo secularism harms the minorities or the disadvantaged within the minorities namely the women communities lgbtq members atheists agnostics and others so when the state doesn't see them as individuals but sees them as members of a religious fold and forces them to abide by orthodoxy the state is abandoning them as free citizens and giving up on their rights of course how individuals see themselves is entirely up to them our case has always been that the state should not force individuals into boxed group identities we also see freedom of expression as a non negotiable capstone of individual rights because without a vigorous exchange of views and ideas india cannot be a free society i think this is critically important this of course includes the right to express what may be offensive ideas to some sections second on liberal economy and the role of government in the economic sphere so welfare and poverty alleviation require sustained economic growth and growth requires free markets the proper economic role of government is to be a regulator and enabler of voluntary free fair exchange between individuals and firms we make the case for market economy not just for purposes of efficiency and productivity but as a system that is both in consonance with india's dharmic civilizational ethos and as a system that helps erase discrimination and social divisions the work of nobel laureate economist gary becker is particularly instructive here for india he had uh, won the nobel prize on his uh, work on the economics of discrimination additionally we see india as constructing a, mo a modern state using digital tools and as harsh mentioned achieving an unprecedented high fidelity legibility this both achieves modern economic governance as well as drastically improves welfare delivery in the trade in the sphere of trade our case is that atmanirbhar capitalism as we call it support and that is support for temporary and limited trade protection is a path to create jobs in labor intensive manufacturing that is necessary for india's economic transformation third on administrative reforms and state capacity we make the case for refocusing india's government onto tasks that are the proper role of government namely delivering speedy justice and contract enforcement internal security policing national defense and of course market regulation that is critically important for having a liberal uh, economy to extract government away from unnecessary activities such as running businesses is a key part of this we also make the case for root and branch reform in india's civil services where there is a case where there is a need for expansion of uh, state capacity in some of the domains that i mentioned finally we also make a strong case for the public funding of students and not schools uh, in india public funding is directed at building public schools whereas we believe that individuals would be better served by giving them vouchers we also argue for higher education liberalization so that india can fulfill its potential as a knowledge power then we argue for an overhaul of the judicial branch in india especially in how judges are appointed we make the case that judiciary has become a closed system and that is breeding a certain nepotism it is fundamentally and undemocratic and we question some of the received wisdom on constitutional jurisprudence in india especially on the validity of the basic structure doctrine in closing our view is that india's potential can be fulfilled all indians can prosper with a shift in governance away from policies advocated by the idea of india after all these are social and economic policies that have been tried for the better part of seven decades and they have mostly failed it is time for india to embrace a new set of ideas unlike some academics and intellectuals who have argued otherwise we believe india the world's only civilizational republic and home to 1/6 of all humanity can and should emerge as a great power on the world stage and that would indeed be a very good thing because of the universalism that india offers this universalism is best captured in this line from a hindu prayer sarve bhavantu sukhina sarve santu niramaya which means may all be happy may all be healthy thank you very much 
Thank you very much, uh, Harsh and Rajiv. Uh, I'm just going to poke in and ask one very brief question, which is actually a clarification. This is not the time to ask questions. But before that, I thought I will clarify on behalf of Harsh that um, when he said Isis, he was referring to the Greek goddess and not to the Isis that is more commonly uh, known these days, because you were speaking fast and one heard the word Isis without that. The clarification. And but I had. It's useful to know how far we've come as a global it is, it is, it is, for, especially for a student of history, it is very useful for me to know. Uh, that's why I picked it up and that's why I said it. Um, um, I just want one clarification. This comes from having read your book from cover to cover and having heard you speak just now. You are saying, irrespective of your argument, argument about a civilizational state, et cetera, et cetera, you are saying that democracy is the central core, the political functioning system through which these will be achieved. Because Absolutely. you do say in, in the idea of your book, which is page 30 in Roman numerals, you say, this book makes the case that a civilizational republic, a democratic polity based on the rule of law that in turn is rooted in India's millennia old pluralistic ethos is the surest guarantee, etc, etc. So you are not anti-democracy as a political system. That is that is certainly not what you're saying at any point. No, yeah. we, okay. you know, the only uh, case of democracy being suspended in India was actually under Indira Gandhi, um, who was the daughter of Nehru and the, and the second prime. Yeah. Third. Yeah, right. And the other thing is that, uh, and, and this is directly connected because the, because the conversation is going to be about liberalism and its types and et cetera, and its functioning is, do you, and either one of you can answer this, do you, however you understand the category liberalism, not liberal, the person, but liberalism, and however you um, subscribe or not subscribe to it, do you see your proposition in this book anywhere on that spectrum of liberalism? Because you do see that yourself making an argument in favor of secularism. You have a chapter titled Saving Secularism from, from Secularists. Now, logically, you would want to save a concept that you want and think should be saved. So by the same logic, uh, in the context of today's discussion, what I'm keen to know is, do you think that what you are proposing is in any way can be within the widest, most elastic framework of what passes for liberalism, or would you rather have it outside it? I'll just answer that, and if Rajiv can add if he wants to, I'll very quickly, without taking much time. See, the point is that is for uh, people who define themselves as liberals, for them to answer. Our, our position is that we do not want any ism that India is subscribing to to be adjudicated in New York, London, or DC. That's why we've deliberately used the word individual rights. That's why we use more often the words separation of religion and state. You're right, we use the word secularism occasionally, but we want to use as few as Western isms as possible, whether they fall in a Western framework or not is for Western philosophers to decide. You could have Indianisms. You could have an Indian liberalism if you chose to create and define I, one. I highly doubt it because then Helena would come and tell us that this is the history of liberalism. According let us, to let us wait to hear what Helena will say. No, I'll, I'll, I'll just add to that. I, I think, uh, as I said in my closing remarks uh, towards the end, uh, what India offers in terms of universalism is actually genuine liberalism. Fine. Okay, that's fine. Mine was, as I said, it was a clarification I was seeking because it's actually not clear in in through through the book. I will, however, correct one thing that Harsh said, which is you don't use secularism occasionally. You actually have an entire chapter on it. However, uh, I do want to uh, say to Shashi Tharoor, and this is both to the credit of uh, Rajiv and Harsh, that Shashi, your endorsement appears on the back cover of the book, and the. On page 28, their paragraph ends with this. I cannot not only resist the temptation to read it for the benefit of others, but I cannot also resist the temptation of smiling when I read it. Some Congress leaders such as Shashi Tharoor have written books explaining the difference between Hinduism and Hindutva as they see it, owning the former while disowning the latter. Although without changes in key policy positions, this rhetoric is ultimately futile sophistry. If ever there was a left-handed compliment, this is it. Um, 
Shashi Tharoor, welcome. Tell us about your book, uh, which um, also I have read from cover to cover, uh, but I was very keen to have you on the panel because you have a section that is called the idea of India. You there, and it is the idea of India, may I say so, um, which is followed by a section called the Hindutva idea of India. And then there's a last section called Reclaiming, right? So please tell us about your book. You have 10 minutes. Right, so thank you very much. Uh, I'll offer my bit of sophistry since you've already announced that's what it's going to be. Uh, in less than a week, we in India will be celebrating our 71st Republic Day, our national celebrations of this momentous anniversary of the entry of force into force of our constitution have been tempered by the raging coronavirus pandemic, which has already claimed the event's chief guest, your prime minister, Boris Johnson, who canceled his visit because of the emergence of a new mutant strain of COVID-19 in the UK. But for many of us, the mood of celebration was also tempered by the realization that never before has the constitution we are celebrating seemed under such threat, with some scholars even writing of the dawn of a second republic that has, they argue, already supplanted the one established on 26 January 1950. So I've tried to deal with this challenge in my, in my, in my, in my the book, The Battle of Belonging, that you've referred to, which seeks to expand our current political contestations into a serious debate on the concept of nationalism and Indian nationhood. These are themes that have uh, increasingly become relevant around the world, and they are contested in contemporary India today since some in our country have been promoting a version of nationalism that in my view foments division and fragmentation within our society. They've made us all participants in a crucial debate that will determine the very nature and future of the India we all love and cherish. Now my book seeks first to outline the evolution of nationalism across the world, its manifestations in society and the various kinds of nationalism that have shaped the concept that serves as a, as a foundation and a lens through which I introduce the contemporary uh, challenges of nationalism um, and indeed nationhood across the world and in India, particularly the clash that we are witnessing today between civic nationalism on the one hand and ethno-religious nationalism on the other. The second part of the book explores the evolution of Indian nationalism from the anti-colonial days to the civic nationalism enshrined in our constitution. And the reason I speak of the idea of India is it is the idea embedded in the constitution. The nationalism that inspired the long struggle for independence was rooted in India's time honored civilization traditions, which I, you know, uh, one phrase where I'm happy to, to endorse language from, uh, from those who've just spoken, from um, Rajiv and Harsh, are time honored civilizational traditions of inclusivity, social justice, religious tolerance and the desire to forge a society that allowed individuals to flourish, irrespective of their religion, their caste, their language, or their place of birth. That's the idea embedded in the constitution. It is today challenged by a new dominant narrative that challenges this basic idea of India and thrives on an exclusionary, aggressive sectarian nationalism based on cultural identity that some call civilizational, and the idea that India is a Hindu Rashtra. In the process, as I explain in the final third of the book, the idea of patriotism has been redefined by the majoritarians. In my view, patriotism is about loving your country because it's yours, because you belong to it and it belongs to you. It excludes no Indian. Whereas the nationalism being promoted in India today is a totalizing vision that excludes those who do not subscribe to it that demands allegiance and brooks no dissent. It's a distinction well worth recognizing in today's India because the question of what it means to be an Indian has attained paramount importance for all of us. In today's India, our constitutional and democratic traditions stand fundamentally questioned by rising intolerance in which the forces unleashed by our present rulers tell Indians what they cannot eat, who they cannot love, what words they must say, what thoughts they cannot hold. Their political attack on their critics as anti-national, within quotes, conceals their prejudiced beliefs 
and it's our duty, I believe, to pull away the hypocrisy and reveal the darkness lurking beneath. So this is where, indeed, as you say, I, I, I demand that we reclaim India. I share my vision for India's future at the end of the book of a nation that rediscovers and reaffirms that liberal and inclusive idea of India and proudly proclaims a brand of patriotism that celebrates pluralism. Now, well, there have been many books in the recent past on these broad themes, including uh, Rajiv and Harsh's. Um, I think there's been havoc wreaked on the social, political, cultural values of India by intolerant and nativist forces. And they have done so, frankly, um, using the techniques of populism, which is what brings me to your topic today uh, in my remaining five minutes. You ask, does liberalism allow populism? Yes, clearly the liberal constitutionalism of India did not obstruct the rise of the BJP, riding a wave of populist majoritarianism. Now, populists, of course, insist they represent the people, within quotes, and the people are, of course, always right. In practice, their supporters are the people, while the corrupt elite are the establishment, the political opposition, the press, the experts, others. And it gets even better when the people can be identified as they are by the present uh, populist forces in India with one religious community, in this case, the Hindus. So you start off with a, a set of ideologues who have argued, as I explain at some length in the book, since the 1920s, that the idea of India that I've summarized, that as I say is in the constitution, is actually wrong. The, the great ideologues of Hindutva, Savarkar, Golwalkar and later the India Adhapadhyay all said the constitution must be completely rejected. Why? Because it seems to assume, they say, that the nation of India uh, is a territory called India and the constitution is written for all the people on it. Wrong, they say, a nation is not a territory, it's a people and the people of India are the Hindu people. And so a populism built on this notion of who is a legitimate Indian, that some are more Indian, some, all Indians are equal, but some are more Indian than others, if you like. That's, that's the thesis. Uh, this puts us in a position of the populace having served as an insurgency in the name of the people, now having come to power and conducting themselves in accordance with these beliefs. Now we all know in democracies, however imperfect, populists of course don't win 100% of the vote, the present ruling party won 37% in the last election and 31 when they first came to power, but they lay claim to 100% of the support of the good people, the real people, those who in their view are not represented by the previous establishment, the corrupt elite, the Congress party that I represent and so on. So populism is essentially in opposition to pluralism. It's an ideology that, uh, that, that rejects, um, if you like, the existence of multiple identities, even within the all embracing uh, term of Indian civilization, I believe our civilization is an evolved hybrid that has indeed embraced multiple identities, but the populace do not embrace this. For them, it is a Hindu nation first and foremost. So given this, the populace believe that the people as a bastion of true morality or civilization are the only legitimate group that the state must represent and cater to and the populists themselves are the only ones to truly represent them. Liberalism means above all the empowerment of the individual and of individual choices, where we live, who we marry, what we eat, how we pray or whether we choose to pray at all. Populism is rooted in exclusion and in the rejection of the legitimacy of selected groups, minorities in particular, immigrants who've been dismissed by our ruling party as termites, the elite, the pseudo secularists, the liberals, and therefore it stands directly in opposition to liberalism, which is in my view rooted in pluralism, a pluralism that emphasizes and celebrates difference and diversity. Nehru, for example, who's a favorite whipping boy of the, of the majoritarians, spoke of India as a land that has always celebrated and welcomed pluralism as an idea vindicated by our history. That we, we not only just coexist with each other, but we thrive in our diversity, which is a strength, not a weakness. Um, and he and a generation of subsequent secular nationalists echoed this tradition of uni unity and diversity. To my mind, and I've, I've said this uh, in the book as well, 
what is uh, the metaphor that I like to use when I was speaking about India in America, for example, is explaining to American audiences that while they may be a melting pot, we are not. We are a thali in India. A thali being an Indian dish, which is a collection of different uh, uh, dishes in different bowls. Uh, because they are in different bowls, they don't necessarily flow into each other, but they belong together on the same platter and they combine on your palate to give you a satisfying repast. That is our unity in diversity to which the, uh, the voices of the majoritarians, notably the current RSS chief Mohan Bhagwat, oppose the notion of diversity and unity. In other words, in India is a sort of saffron khichdi in which there may be a piece of gajas sticking up there or a piece of aloo sticking up somewhere else, but ultimately the unity is what, uh, is what matters. And there's a little bit of diversity permitted around it, but within, within that one unity. Now, this is where we, we essentially part. Um, Freudians in the Yugoslav civil war spoke of the narcissism of minor differences. In India, by contrast, I would speak of the commonality of major differences, because in our notion taught to us by the great Swami Vivekanand, uh, my personal hero since my teens, um, he taught us that Hinduism and Indianness are about more than tolerance, because tolerance is essentially a very patronizing idea. He says it's about acceptance. He says, there is only one truth, sages call it by different names. And just as different rivers flow down different hillsides, some straight, some crooked, and end up in the same sea, so also all ways of worship end up at the same divine. And that essentially Hindu idea is what strengthens our pluralism. We accept that there are various ways of worship. We accept and embrace these differences. And we say that we will indeed accept uh, each other with mutual respect for what we are. I will respect your truth, please respect my truth. That is the basic liberal principle, which is also a core Hindu civilizational principle. People, unfortunately, populists see people in terms of specific categories, like their religion, their, 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 their identity in commun communal terms, rather than in terms of their individuality, that cannot be reconciled with the core tenets of liberalism. And we've seen in India that minorities are especially vulnerable as they are the ones most often dismissed by the populace as outsiders in need of removal or of, of subordination. Right. Liberalism, of course, is firmly tied to respect for the rule of law, uh, the best way to safeguard the rights of the individual, which is where our liberal constitutionalism comes in, whereas populism threatens the rule of law because they believe the people as the only moral group and their political representatives are always right. They're more so than the law. Liberalism has a healthy respect for science and scholarship. Populism sees expertise as being secondary to political objectives and indeed the promotion of some fairly absurd things. I'm a great respecter of the achievements of ancient India, but some of the uh, arrant nonsense that is being peddled by the majoritarians sadly discredit even the real achievements of the past. Populism is absolutist and sees the world in black and white, regardless of nuance or facts, with devastating results, which is why the BJP government labels everyone who opposes them as traitors and anti-nationals, populist terms that whip up hatred and violence against the government's opponents without engaging with their arguments. I think liberalism should never allow such behavior because it underpins, under, uh, it undermines the underpinnings of the basic uh, right. civilizational construct of liberal constitutionalism, which involves mutual respect and respect for democratic values. So yes, the answer to your question, Nilanjan, is liberalism, yes, can allow uh, or permit populism, the very populism that negates liberalism itself. Thank okay, you. I'm going to give a chance to Rajiv and to Hush to come back on this, but slightly later. Uh, you've both had your chances of punching the Congress and the BJP, uh, and I've made a note of that, and that's absolutely fine. But I do want to bring in the commentators because what we have over here, and what we'll do is we'll ask Akash to speak first, uh, and then uh, Michael and, and, and then Helena. Uh, what you've just heard are two overlapping but opposing views of, of, of the understanding, the perception of, of political realities in, in India, you know, almost 1.4 billion people, a functioning democracy, whatever problems individuals may have with that democracy. Um, and, and that is one of the reasons why I wanted to give the chance to, to, uh, uh, to Rajiv and to Hush to clarify that what they were suggesting was in no way undemocratic, uh, that, that the democratic process, that is leaders are elected through elections, 
uh, and become representatives of people in, in parliament. Uh, that is that. Uh, I, I wanted to clarify that. I'm going to bring in Akash, but before that, if I could just broaden this, um, once again, reasserting that uh, what, what I said to Hush, which is that I am not necessarily using words and concepts as manifestations of either a combination or a consolidation of a set of Western, however you may understand it, constructs. Because to me, the West is not an undifferentiated lot. The West is a differentiated lot. Not all of the West is white. Not all of the West is Christian. Not all of the West is Catholic. Uh, not all of the West is Protestant. Um, and so on and so forth. However, as all of us know, as was actually evident also, uh, Harsh and Rajiv, from, from your book, but also from Shashi's book, is that when we are writing in English, you have to acknowledge that English is a language with a finite vocabulary. And we have to ultimately end up using the words, some of the words that we may not always want to use, and yet we don't have enough words to be able to, to explain it. I mean, I was taken, for instance, by your description of dharma in a, in a very, very uh, you know, um, particular way. You, you quote Pandurang Kani, uh, you know, students of history like me have read it when we were in our undergrad, uh, but the point is that you know yourself that it isn't so easily defined. Right? It is a complicated thing. And I'm not even taking you in the direction of how dharm differs from Ashoka's dham. I'm not even going in the Buddhist direction. Okay, I'm going to bring in uh, Akash and Michael and Helena. Uh, there are two or three issues that I want to begin with. The first of which is, uh, and Michael and Helena embodied two sides of it from two sides of the pond, is liberalism differently practiced with a written constitution or with an unwritten constitution? Does, does a written constitution uh, concretize and therefore limit the way in which liberalism comes to be practiced because you then have the constitution to refer to. India had, has the longest constitution. It was written by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. I don't want to miss the chance to say he's an LSE alumnus and did his PhD from LSE. And, and Akash has just published five or six volumes from OUP, I think, uh, on, on Ambedkar's writings. Uh, but I will, uh, I will bring Akash in first, just to respond to what you've heard. And also uh, to, to begin the conversation about how the practice of liberalism uh, or liberal politics, inclusive of a period of emergency. Um, I don't know, I, I don't want to believe that Harsh actually lived through the emergency, but if it interests you, Harsh, I actually lived through the emergency in Delhi. Um, so, um, but, but whether or not, you see, we, what, what we have in front of us is, is a system that has functioned in different ways in different parts of the world. Uh, people have defined, practiced it in different ways. Has, Shashi has made an argument that yes, liberalism by its very nature, by allowing different opinions, all kinds of opinions to be heard, also creates space for opinions that are eventually non-liberal to also uh, prosper or, or, or grow in, 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 its, in its own way. Uh, is that so? Is, is liberalism, has it through its evolution uh, become something where it is its own nemesis because of its own practices? Akash. Thank you, Nella, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, on the last point that you made about liberalism becoming its own nemesis, we have heard that for um, nearly a century now yeah. with, uh, of course, the, uh, the mechanism through which um, Hitler came to power, uh, not necessarily by abrogating the Weimar Constitution, but by using the Weimar Constitution to abrogate uh, uh, the Constitution. So, I don't think that's the newest question that's around. Maybe the newer question derives from this idea of emergency, because you're suggesting that Hajj didn't live through the emergency. But times have changed so much that emergency doesn't need to be declared now for its effective implementation 
to be a reality for each of us. And if you look at suspensions of habeas corpus, uh, 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 jailing for uh, speech that is not um, uh, actionable speech, that's merely uh, uh, free uh, speech, and other curtailments of rights that are going on all over the world, and especially in India, then one sees that the times have changed so that, um, so that uh, what was once required to be a declaration of emergency can now happen within the bounds of uh, constitutionalism uh, as it's currently interpreted. Uh, you had asked me to ask a, a question uh, to each of the, uh, the authors, which I'd like to do. Um, one thing that, um, that really concerns me uh, is the way that um, each of the, the books was described um, in, in, a, in a manner that almost mimics their content. So uh, Dr. Tarur's book was articulated with uh, a kind of um, uh, comprehensive uh, goodwill and, uh, and um, uh, Harsh and Rajiv's book was, was, it, was, was described with sort of digs at intellectuals and academics and elites and, and so on. Um, and there, there's, there's something that as a, uh, as a pseudo intellectual, um, I, uh, uh, I find appealing about that attack that Harsh and Rajiv made. And, and that's what I want to ask you, uh, Dr. Tarun. You write often about constitutional patriotism um, and, uh, and uh, distinguish it from ethno-religious uh, nationalism. And something that characterizes both of these is the way that they the, the way that they deal with um, emotions, and uh, and there's a coolness, an icy cold uh, aspect to constitutional patriotism. It's very hard to consider uh, fomenting a crowd behind um, secularism, but it is very easy to foment. Uh, uh, you know, to amass an enormous crowd, a violent one, uh, around ideas of uh, religion. And uh, just the same, when you're advocating for constitutional essentials, constitutional principles, uh, secularism, pluralism, inclusion, how do you generate the kind of heat and passion that it is so easy for the right, for the populist, for the nationalist to generate when they stir up uh, uh, crowds around Hindutva? Around attacking institutions, around um, attacking elites and um, and pseudo intellectuals and secularism and and so on. So, what you advocate in your book, which I you know completely subscribe to, is just a very uh, a, a cold substitute for what uh, Harsh and Rajiv advocate, which is very heated, very compelling. Um, uh, I think. I mean, I should just state, I, I think it's 100% wrong, but it's, it, 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 it fires up the emotions. And so what we, what we find today is this battle between, uh, a losing battle between constitutional uh, 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 patriotism and, um, and a far more robust and fiery and appealing, um, even if anti-intellectual and anti-science and, and so on, um, sort of populist nationalism. So this is something I don't think you've addressed in the book. So I'd like to hear what you have to say about it. How do we proceed, given what you say may be true? How do we proceed if it doesn't fire up any passions? I take your point, Akash, and in fact, I must say that um, am, am I unmuted? Yes, I, I must say that uh, I, I wouldn't have used the word cold, but I would say reasonable, calm rather than cold. Uh, these are. Liberalism thrives on, on reason, on argument, on explanation, on accommodation, on conciliation, rather than on, on sort of rage or, or outrage or whipping up emotions. And that, that is undoubtedly problematic in every democracy that populism has risen in. The populists have tended to have the monopoly over outrage, over passion, over the whole works, in fact, that actually uh, give them a monopoly of that sense of, of, of feeling. But in my section on reclaiming India, I do try and appeal to the emotion as well by speaking about the patriotism that I have written and celebrated 
as anchored in emotions, in little local patriotisms, in your in 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 in, in the tears that well to your eyes when you hear a favorite song or whiff a local aroma uh, or, or see a sm sight or, or, or a sound, hear a sound, a smell of an area you associate with your home. That evocation of homeland is what I want to anchor in my notion of, of, of patriotism. And I would say that India's sort of patriotism is actually made up of many, many local patriotisms in different parts of the country that inform the experience of individual Indians. Um, the, the, the patriotism that a Bengali hears when he hears, uh, you know, DL Rai's, I mean, hey, they shed their John Mojano, hey, they shed their Mori. Whereas Jawaharlal Nehru has tears springing to eyes when he hears Lata Mangeshka speaking, singing of Mary Watan Ke Logo. I mean, these are both equally valid patriotisms and perhaps linguistically mutually incomprehensible to the singers of each. So the point is that there is that emotion, that sense of belonging that I want us to reclaim. As I said in the course of my remarks, patriotism is essentially like love, like the love of you have for your mother. It's you belong to her, she belongs to you. You belong to your country, your country belongs to you. And that sense of belonging is ultimately an emotion, Akash. And it's that emotion that I'm harking back to. Okay. But that, that emotion also grants to others the right to have the same emotion, even if they don't speak your language, look like you, uh, practice the same religion as you, uh, uh, have the same caste or, or state identity as you. That's essentially the difference. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I, I was interrupting you. Uh, Rajiv and Harsh, be assured you will get your turn. Um, uh, Akash, thank you very much for your comments. I did want to say one thing, though, which was that I did purposely go back to the whole question of whether liberalism is a space within which, uh, you know, uh, the this, 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 you know, if, if liberalism is its own nemesis, as it were, precisely for the reason that you said, is that we seem to have, in terms of political civilizational circularity, come back in various parts of the world uh, to, to, to this point where it now seems to be a question worth, worth asking again, but I'm completely with you that it is an age-old question. There was nothing new or novel about what I was saying. Uh, Michael, would you, would you uh, like, like to say something? Yeah. Okay, well, let's let's start with with the point that you just made, uh, Milanjan, uh, which is uh, that uh, whether liberalism is its own nemesis, uh, all ideologies can be their own nemesis. There's nothing special about liberalism in that. And uh, one of the features of liberalism is that uh, its open endedness will always allow for uh, contrary views to creep in and to challenge liberalism. Liberalism has always been a, a political view and ideology and the siege, right? It is not the ruling ideology. It is not, the, it is not the, 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 the dominant ideology. It has always been ideology and the siege. And I would also, uh, uh, apropos, uh, uh, diverge from, from, from the very dichotomous views that I've heard before. I mean, you use the, the, the concept of dichotomy implicitly, silently, as, as, as some of your defining characteristics. And I know there was, there was some sort of slight uh, 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 um, qualification about the West. I don't like the term the West at all. Just, I wouldn't call, if, I, if, if this was reversed, I always give this an example. Would I call India, Japan, China, Malaysia, the East, and, 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 and describe them as one category? Certainly not. And I wouldn't describe as one category all the, not only the, the, the states, not just the, the different subcultures within what is loosely called the West. Is, is, is Albania the same as, as, as Peru and, and Australia? Are these part of the West? It is not a geographical concept, uh, uh, it, but it is also not a, 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 a concept with any meaningful categorization. It is a rhetorical concept. And, and people also use the terminology that, that we're talking about all the time is used rhetorically. It may, it is also substantial, but the danger is it slips into a rhetorical mode, which is of course quite understandable when you're trying to advocate a point of view, when you're trying to take political sides, that is exactly what happens. And liberalism does this as well. Liberalism is not always sort of a, 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 a meek and, and, and compromising. It gets hot under the collar when we talk about the death penalty, when we talk about basic rights, it, 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 it has got red lines that, that it refuses to cross. So there, is, uh, there are, in, in a way, sections of dogmatism 
if you want to call it in inverted commas, within liberalism as well. Of course, this is the nature of any ideological viewpoint. So that, that but, but let, let me go back to the, uh, the question you asked about uh, the quaintly called pond. Uh, um, <laughs> okay, that always amuses me, but never mind. Uh, um, the distinction between a, a written and a non-written constitution, again, it isn't as sharp as all that. Both the constitutional and the non-constitutional arrangements have got advantages and great flaws, and I'll give, I'll give one or two examples. Uh, uh, the, 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 a written constitution is open to constant diverse interpretation. I mean, look at the Supreme Court in the United States, a, 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 a group of, 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 of uh, people who have been motivated and, 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 and nominated by, by strong ideological partisanship. And then it's, 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 it's given the aura of, of, of a, an organization or an institution that, that is responsible for, for uh, representing the constitution. Well, it's not. It's given particular interpretations of the constitution. And, we, and whenever we look at, at these, uh, uh, these practices, we're always looking at particular interpretations of, of the practices, just like the particular interpretations of, of liberalism. And we in this country have a, have, don't have a written constitution. That doesn't mean that we haven't got very uh, formal uh, rules about what can happen and what can't happen. They're simply not, they're not written down in a single uh, 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 primary document, but they're written down in laws. And uh, uh, if we go back to one of the nice features of liberalism, it is it's the, the idea of reflectiveness, of, it can reflect on itself. It is open to, to changing its own uh, methods of, 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 of practice and of, and, 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 and of, and of policy making, uh, uh, because it is a self, one of the, I think one of the crucial things about liberalism is that it is a self-reflecting set of ideas. Uh, uh, and and, and that, uh, that I think is, is, is one of its great strengths. Um, it, it, it always looks at, at uh, some of the, uh, um, possibilities that change over time. And that's why one of the features of, 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 of liberalism, which hasn't been mentioned so far, is uh, individual growth. The notion of change is crucial to, to liberalism. The free development of individuality, you find this in chapter three of Mills on Liberty, second paragraph, second sentence. I always think this is the key of on liberty, the free development of individuality. You've got three concepts that interlink and interchange. You can't have any one without the other two. And so we have a notion of, of temporal change. So we have the liberalism of space, you know, keep out of my, of my garden, you know, this is my, this is my territory uh, because I've got rights. But you've got the liberalism of time, you know, uh, 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 allow us to, 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 to develop and change and, and, and to, to improve our, 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 our quality is both political and personal. Uh, uh, so this is this, this notion of, of, of evolution, of development, uh, and again, the notion of open-endedness, which, which, which I, I referred to, to earlier. So uh, another way of, of, of putting it is that if you, if you contrast on this one dimension, populism versus liberalism, it's the difference between fast food and slow cooking. The point of, 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 of liberals is that they have to take their time and it's frustrating for others and sometimes for themselves as well. They have to chew over their ideas and their policies, uh, whereas, whereas the, 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 the populist, and not only the populist uh, uh, method, is fast food, the immediacy. Uh, uh, and, and it's the lack of, lack of immediacy, which I think is, is, is one, of the, one of the positive features of liberalism. Take your time, let's think it over. Let's try this out. We might want to change this, might not want to change it. We can look back, look at it again in three or five or 10 years time. For instance, our membership of the European Union, which we have very unfortunately now uh, been excluded. Uh, I'm talking about Britain. Uh, so these things are still open, open, open to change. And that's one of the features of, 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 of this slow cooking, slow cooking, hear the other side. Audi alterum paratem, here the other side, you know, that's, 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 which yeah. is in, in, in sharp contrast to some of the features of populism. You know, there is no other side that is worth hearing to, say, the populists. Sure. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I should say, uh, for the benefit of the, all those who are watching on Facebook, that I'm trying very, very hard not to slip into a discussion of the politics of Britain at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, because that is not the purpose of this. Uh, but uh, could I could I ask Helena to to uh, say say something, uh, whatever whatever she'd like to say at at this point? Uh, Michael Frieden, I am going to get back to you. Uh, with one particular point, which is directly related to the context of uh, Harsh and Rajiv's book, which is the question of individuals and individual rights. Mm -hmm. uh, like every argument and like every proposal, uh, it has its pros and cons. And if you actually read Harsh and Rajiv's book carefully, you will see that while they don't obviously go ahead and say, yes, these are the problems with what we are saying, you can see that there are slippages because there are slippages, no idea is perfect. Uh, but before we get there, and I will bring Harsh and Rajiv back in uh, just now, Helena. I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Neil and John, for, for, uh, for inviting me. I'm, I'm um, thrilled to be, uh, to be here uh, with these distinguished panelists. Now, I understood that I was supposed to first ask some questions and then later make a little a presentation about liberalism and populism. So, I, um, so I'm first going to ask some questions. I read uh, uh, two questions, one for... Um, um, each book. Uh, I read from cover to cover three books today. I read the battle um, for, in preparation for today, I read the battle for belonging. I read a new um, idea of India. And I also read um, the car, excuse me, preamble. Um, but I have to admit with some embarrassment that that's just about all I know about India. Um, I do know quite a bit about the history of liberalism in Europe and in America, but very little about India. I did read some years ago Christopher Bailey's um, book and, and that's again, um, but that's it. Um, so forgive me for that. And I have to say, these books are so fabulously well written and so engaging and so informative that when I read one, um, I found myself nodding my head and going, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then I read the other one. <laughs> wow, yeah, yeah, that's very good. And so then I had to go back and sort of and sort of compare them and see, well, how, you know, how do they compare and how do they really disagree with one another? So I say that all three, uh, now I'm speaking about um, uh, the Battle of Belonging and uh, A New Idea of India. So I took a few uh, short notes. All three uh, authors, it seems to me, support liberalism, secularism, and nationalism, although they define these differently or approve of different versions of these isms. Um, all three authors speak glowingly of India's heritage, its traditions, and um, particularly the tradition of religious toleration. And finally, all three um, are for progress, prosperity, reform, and in a sense for modernity and harmony among um, the citizens of India. All three also seem to think that you need some kind of buying values to make this nation cohere and prosper. So it seems that you agree on a lot of things actually. Um, in fact, you're all, it seems, for individual rights. Both books express support for individual rights and speak about it, and particularly Hinduism's support of notions of individual rights. Now, I just, the, my first question is for ta, um, Sha, Shashi Tarur then. You speak eloquently about Hinduism's support for notions of individual rights. You speak also eloquently about Hinduism and your own interpretation of Hinduism. Let me just quote you very briefly. For me as a congressman and a liberal, I find it easy to claim allegiance to Hinduism, a religion that is personal and individualistic, privileges the individual and does not subordinate one to a collectivity, a religion that grants complete freedom to the believer to find his or her own answer to the true meaning of life a religion that offers a wide range of choice and religious practice uh, and so on and so forth. A religion that places great emphasis on one's mind and values one's capacity for reflection, intellectual inquiry and self-study. I'll stop there. 
Now, so I want to ask you if these, if you feel that these are the values and this is the kind of religion that prepares citizens for living in a liberal democracy. And then I want to ask something that might be a little bit controversial, but I would like to ask you, would you say the same thing about Islam? Much of your arguments between you seem to be about Islam and how it fits into uh, Indian civilization or, or um, the good kind of nationalism that you speak about. Uh, does Islam favor individual rights? Look, I mean, I, I don't claim to be an authority on Islam. I'm not really claiming to be an authority on Hinduism, except that as a practicing Hindu and one who has read uh, a lot of the sacred texts of the faith, as well as exegesis of it, I do feel a little more entitled to pronounce myself on my own faith. And I consider that my description of my faith is valid for me and for many others I know, because I've written an entire book on what you've just written, read a paragraph aloud from this book on. I've written an entire book on why I'm a Hindu, which explains uh, my notion of, of, of Hindu uh, uh, philosophy, teaching, and living. So I, I will not presume to speak about Islam with uh, not even possessing uh, a single percentage of the same sort of awareness or reading or familiarity that I have. But I would argue that for the purposes of today's discussion, the question really isn't relevant, Helena, because I'm not arguing about whether Islam permits one thing or not. I'm saying this is the idea of India and the constitution. It says everyone's equal, everyone can be what they want to be, and everyone has the same rights, irrespective of whether they're following Islam or following Hinduism or choosing to follow neither. And that, to my mind, is the answer that I would hold to. So I am free to practice the Hinduism I understand. Somebody else has a very different notion of Hinduism. He or she may practice that. A third person may prefer to be one of many varieties of Christians. I come from a, a state where there are 13 different competing Christian churches actively thriving and flourishing in, in my state, Kerala. Uh, and, and all of these things actually fit in very comfortably into the notion of the acceptance of difference that has been instilled into the civilization of India, I would argue, since time immemorial. Uh, and therefore, in fact, Hinduism, interestingly enough, for example, doesn't have any one single notion uh, uh, of, 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 of the visualization of the Godhead. Uh, Hinduism says, listen, God is essentially unknowable, uh, unattainable, except you know, by the super sages or by those who are dead. Uh, so you worship as you see fit. And if you want to imagine God as a ten-armed woman riding a tiger for the purposes of focusing your worship, you're welcome to do so. If you want to imagine God as a pot-bellied man with an elephant head, that's fine too. And by the same logic, if you want to imagine God as a bleeding man suffering on a cross, the Hindu has no problem with that. And this is something which unfortunately is at variance from the so-called Hindu majoritarian politics of the Hindutva movement, which actually is trying to semitize Hinduism into a much more narrow monolithic version of the faith. So as a Hindu, my battle is within Hinduism rather than with Islam. But as far as I'm concerned, a Muslim is free to have the same battles within his own faith. And I would encourage it. I would welcome Muslim reformers to have their say against the Muslim conservatives. Uh, and, and, and as far as I'm concerned, that's what Indian democracy should encourage and permit. Okay, thanks. We are going to come to this very soon. Uh, Helena, if you could ask your question to uh, to Thank Raj. you, thank you very much, thank you. So, much so it, it's kind of related. Um, um, the second question. So to Rajiv Mantri and Harsh Madhusan, um, following up on that is, is dismantling group rights for you really a strategy for the promotion of the liberalization of Islam? Um, and in fact, dissolving or dismantling groups altogether? Um, you say, I like to quote a few things that you say, the degree of economic freedom determines the type of social capital and the greater the economic freedom, the more likely it is that communities not tied exclusively to social, religious, linguistic, or ethnic identity will emerge. And elsewhere, competitive capitalism, as opposed to crony socialism, is gradually dissolving the bonds of caste and community. Are you then for um, not this tali, but more for a melting pot? 
Uh, you say on page 50, a classically liberal state, which seems to be what you are for, will most likely become more homogeneous. Um, so what do you really mean by that in terms of values and religion? And what bonds will replace the bonds of caste and community in your mind? You say that the idea that constitutional morality by itself is, um, Mm, oh, that constitutional mal morality by itself is the is that the idea that constitutional morality by itself is the only legitimate form of patriotism is deliberately vague and obtuse. So, what are you going to replace it with? And what do you mean by an India specific modernity? Sorry, didn't mean to be so long winded. Uh, can I take the first one, Harsh, and then you can take the second one on constitutional morality? So uh, thank you, Helena, for those thoughtful questions. So I found it very interesting that Shashi should say that uh, he doesn't comment on uh, Islam because actually, or, or in, in a policy sense, then you know he might extend that further and simply echo uh, Nehru, who has said that let, let reform come from them. So the problem with that is, uh, uh, you know, are we are we then saying that the Indian government and the Indian Prime Minister and the Indian state governments do they not represent India's 200 million Muslims? If they can make policies for uh, people of all stripes, of all uh, the diverse strands of Hinduism, why can't they make policy for uh, adherents of Islam who are also citizens of India? So uh, in, his, in his book, actually, Shashi has written against the Uniform Civil Code, which I find very interesting. So uh, is it that Shashi favors religion-based laws and then he calls himself secular and liberal? How does that work? And then to your question, Helena, on dismantling group rights as a strategy to liberalize Islam, I would say the point is the state should not force individuals to declare themselves apostates if they disagree with some facet of Islam. So why is the Indian state anointing itself arbiter of religion? So the state should make laws, policies for individual citizens of India. And then, you know, if, if, if a particular uh, devout Muslim or a devout Hindu, if they want to follow something, let them follow it. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll continue. Thank you so much for the question. Um, I'll, I'll just take a brief detour to answer what Helena has asked, but also to respond to uh, very briefly what Shashi and Akash, and perhaps even Michael has mentioned. So, you know, there, there, is, a, there is a Shirdi Sai Baba Mandir uh, near Mumbai. And I went there uh, just a couple of years ago there with my wife. Uh, and Sai Baba, you know, this man in the 19th century apparently was a Muslim individual. He never at least overtly gave up on Islam, but he was considered as a saint, including my local Hindus. And today in his mandir, it's in his temple, not in his mosque, um, you can go and you can pray to him. Some people use the phrase Om Sai Ram, which is a way of kind of mixing and matching this Muslim individual, holy man, with the Hindu God of Ram. And that is how I fully agree with Shashi. And in some ways, I think Shashi is a better spokesperson of what he calls Hindutva than he realizes. In the sense that uh, you know, Hinduism has mutual acceptance. Exactly what Shashi said, quoting Vivekanand. But what he has uh, basically deflected and has not answered is Islam and Christianity do not. Islam and Christianity say that there is only one God. There is one prophet. In the case of Islam, they say it's the last prophet. And if you do not subscribe to that vision, at least according to Orthodox and classical Islam, you will burn in hell forever. And therefore, therefore, Sai Baba is not followed by Muslims. Kabir, another heterodox Muslim, you know, on the borders of Hinduism and Islam, synthetic, uh, syncretic Hinduism and Islam. We have Kabir Pantis who are Hindus, but they're no longer Muslims. Similarly, all kind of folk Islam is increasingly under threat from Saudi Wahhabi funded mosques. And actually Shashi writes about that in his book. He says that three, four decades ago, it would be difficult to see any woman in a hijab in Kerala, but today it is difficult to see one without. So it, you have to understand there are parallel societies growing in India, exactly what Emmanuel Macron spoke about. Emmanuel Macron was the kind of darling of left liberals or liberals till a couple of years ago. And now he's the new villain just short of being Hitler, simply because he brought up this topic after the beheading of a teacher for the crime of blasphemy. And, there, and remember, the blasphemy law in India actually came 
because of anti-Muslim speech, uh, speech in colonial India in 1929, if I'm not wrong about the date. So we have to understand that what we are trying to what we are trying to fix here is, as you rightly mentioned, Helena, and therefore your question is very relevant, is what is Islam's role in Indian civilization? Can we have a heterodox Islam? Can we have a liberal Islam? And we do have reformists. Shashi says, Shashi does say he supports them, but he would say that reform must come from within. But well, the point is, what if reform does not come from within? It's been 70 years. We do not have any uh, loud voice speaking for monogamy in Islam in India. In fact, triple talaq, which we criminalized, was considered to be very oppressive. Whereas if a Hindu man marries twice, it's not a civil offense in India, it's a criminal offense. He is sent to jail. So the point is, if somebody is speaking, it's very abstract and abstruse in Indian secular liberalism discussion, and deliberately so, and vaguely so. If we are for equality in front of the law, we have to be for equality in front of the law. Shashi cannot say that because his party is in alliance with the front of the Jamaat e Islami in Kerala. And uh, you know, even earlier, Shashi would, in an abstract level, speak for free speech. But then in a debate with Christopher Hitchens many years ago, he spoke against it when it came to offense that Muslims perceive. And that's the reality, and that's a trend of demographics in Kerala. And we have to face this squarely. Are we legitimizing parallel societies because of different laws for different Indian citizens? And if so, it is perfectly legitimate for Indian Hindus to be afraid of changing demographics in border regions such as Jammu and Kashmir. This is not a very wholesome conversation. I totally understand that. I understand why Akash says he fully 100% disagrees with us. But just removing your sight from that does not make the problem go away. We have to discuss it squarely and fairly. Thank you. May I respond since yes. I've, I've been mentioned by both speakers? Sure. Yes, I, I, I'll keep it brief. Uh, yeah, do, do the, keep it brief, but just so one. And also add, it's not just the Jamaat e Islami in Kerala, it is also the AIU DF in Assam that Congress is allied with. Okay, yeah. can we, we're not I, allied with the Jamaat e okay. Islami in Kerala. That's just, a mistake. Yeah, uh, no, that's 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 party. Simply, you know what I mean? Party. You yeah. have yeah. Them in the local body elections last month. Ra Rajiv, please. Uh, could I could I just say this much? The that, IUML is our ally and they're not part of the yeah. Jamaat. But okay. Let's come back to the core issue that both. Uh, rather than Harshwaj, it's an important one. I, I mean, Rajiv and Harshwaj, it's an important one, which is that when we speak of, of course, every state government, the prime minister of India, every Indian institution is accountable to and represents all Indian citizens, irrespective of their religion. That is indeed what the constitution requires. But equally, as you know, our country's laws recognize something called personal law, which is that on matters involving marriage, inheritance, and divorce, and that's pretty much the entire list, personal law is governed by the traditional religious law of each community, except for the Hindus, because the Hindu code bill became law in 1956, and the Hindus um, essentially therefore are governed under that civil law. Whereas indeed, Muslims have their own personal law, and so do other communities. Now, what we are saying, and what I've said, is that I'm intellectually in favor of a uniform civil code, but given the fact that these communities have enjoyed the rights over their personal law for generations, in fact, going back to the British days, that it cannot be abrogated without bringing them along. And therefore, I'm only not in favor of an imposition of the uniform civil code, but rather of a one which the communities will agree to. And that's why I'm very happy to give encouragement to Muslim reformers who want to reform their personal law. It's very interesting that the same pair of young people who are arguing that the state should not interfere with religion, which I agree with entirely, now want the state to interfere with personal law, which is classically based on religious, uh, on religious law. So I'm the one who's actually being consistent. My liberalism tells me, let them be as they wish to be. Incidentally, the laws of India provide that if, for example, a Muslim woman does not wish to marry under Islamic personal law, she has the right to opt out and marry a husband under the Special Marriages Act. Same for a Muslim man. It's not that your personal law is binding on you. And for me, as a liberal, coercion is the test, not culture. Yes, you're born a Muslim, but that doesn't mean you have to practice everything that the conservative elements in your religion tell you you must do. You don't have to wear a hijab. I have many Indian Muslim friends, women friends who don't wear the hijab. 
But the fact is that uh, many have felt compelled to do so. They've been given the sort of impression by elements in their society that the only way to be a good Muslim is to dress like that. And I'm saying as a liberal, you, have the, you should have the freedom and you do have the freedom under our country's laws not to dress like that if you choose not to. But it's becoming increasingly, unfortunately, a courageous decision for them within their own society. That's why reform must come within those religious communities. Okay. Sorry, I'm just going to I'm just going to poke in here for, for a particular reason because we are running out of time, and at the heart of this is a question that I think needs to be discussed with the commentators as well. Uh, what Harsh and Rajiv are referring to, which is the Uniform Civil Code uh, in India, uh, and and the, the, Michael and Helena, you would have gathered uh, from from what Shashi Harsh and Rajiv have said, is that. Uh, there are the personal religious uh, civil codes and laws that, that apply to, to, to groups. Now, I am, as, as a student of Islamic history myself, slightly perturbed by this almost pathological obsession with Islam and Muslims in these debates across the world. This wasn't a point I was making about India. But um, there is a wider question. Uh, this is for Akash, for, for Michael, and for Helena, uh, and then for, for the three of you as well to, to join in, is that if you take your mind away from India for a moment and look at various other countries, and I have been sent emails in the time that I've been advertising this event about why I used a word like populism. And what was I trying to say, which is the reason why if you read the concept note, I actually say that I'm using it as a shorthand that is used so that people know what I'm referring to. It's not something that I necessarily subscribe to, uh, but majoritarianism, strong man, et cetera. So all, all these are words that have come up just as some, uh, I think Akash used the word secular and there are several others. I said, you know, they've, they've come up from, from uh, various, uh, various sides and various corners. But if you remove your gaze from India for the moment or from South Asia for the moment and look across the world. And there have been several new governments that have gone uh, against the grain of the political evolution, evolution uh, that that country had been practicing till then, okay? And has been identified as being less liberal, non-liberal, illiberal, whichever way you look at it, whether it is Brazil, whether it's Hungary, whether it's Turkey, whether it is Philippines, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, we are not discussing Russia here. Um, so uh, the, the, the important point is, there is a pervasive feeling, and as we have just seen in the United States under, under uh, Trump, I can now say rather than President Trump, um, there is a pervasive feeling that the practice of classical liberalism somehow rides on the duality of appeasement of minority groups and likewise expect uh, an often unclarified generosity of understanding of whichever is the majority group. There, there, is, a, there is a pervasive feeling across, across, across the spectrum about this, of the whole question of, of uh, minority appeasement. And this is not just about Muslims. Uh, it, it applies in various ways. Now, I'm going to give you a few examples that purposely do not relate to Muslims, uh, because I think the conversation then goes off in a very easily and predictably polarized uh, direction. Uh, from India, uh, let me give you an example, which I'm sure Akash and Shashi will remember, the two of you might have read about it, but in the 1980s, late, late in the 1980s, there was this law uh, that was required that two-wheeler riders and pillion riders would wear helmets, right? It, then an exception was made for Sikhs because the argument that was made was that Sikhs only wear turbans to co cover their hair and both Sikh men and women because keeping their hair long, not cutting their hair is a religious requirement and therefore they were then not going to cover it with something else apart from their turban, okay? There was an exception made for that, okay? Um, Michael, here in Britain, uh, there was a law passed, on the other hand, which would be of interest to this discussion, criminalizing female genital mutilation, FGM, which is practiced by several communities and groups of, of people who are migrants here from sub-Saharan Africa, but according to the, the, the understanding 
of, of this country and its sense of rightness, it was considered to be wrong. So even though it was an issue that dealt with uh, a customary practice of a minority group, it was decided that the state would criminalize it, even if it was a minority group. Is there something in the very practice, in the very logic of liberalism, and, and, and Michael said uh, that, uh, use the word dogmatism, that like everything, it, liberalism has its own dogmatisms. Uh, and yes, I take all your points, Michael, that, that, that you know, there's a question of time, it's a slow cook, um, you know, uh, it allows space for everyone, therefore it allows space for non-liberal, illiberal forces to grow as, as well. But is there something in the logic of liberalism itself that, even inadvertently and unintentionally leaves a, a majority group of people feeling that chosen sections are being appeased in a way that does not seem to be either democratic or more importantly, equal. I'll end with, I'll, I'll end with one example of liberal dogma. Um, all of you must know rec the recent uh, episode concerning JK Rowling and uh, what she said. Now, Michael, I'm, I'm going to pose this to you, but I'm not asking you to give your opinion on the issue as such. But there is a certain, what, what certain, some, some people would identify a tyrannical element to the practice of liberalism, which has given birth to something called cancel culture. Now, I'm not saying I agree with it, but I have read this being written um, and, and talked about where even amongst, if you look at the Harper's Bazaar letter that was signed by the people who, who did sign it, there are diehard liberals in it who are saying that, why is it that another view cannot be taken, howsoever unpleasant uh, that view may be. Uh, in this instance, the, the view expressed by um, by, by J.K. Rowling. Is that, is that correct? Is it so that liberalism also has in it elements of intolerance in it? So the combination of the three things I have said, the three examples I have given you, uh, the, the J.K. Rowling example, the example of exception made for Sikhs wearing helmets and the FGM, this, this unevenness of its practice is this inadvertently creating a feeling of majoritarian dis discrimination and therefore feeding into uh, a larger self-invested, self-interested discourse that seeks to gain suprem supremacy simply because of numbers? Michael. You need to unmute yourself. No. No. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Good. Okay. So Rousseau, maybe no liberal himself, ends the social contract with uh, the phrase, we must always be intolerant about intolerance. And uh, that is an interesting point. But I, was, I, would say, I would say something about, for instance, the, 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 the FGM example that you gave. What, what happens uh, is that liberal, liberals are very wary about causing harm. And the practices of harm and what constitutes harm change over time. So in the 19th century, harm was mainly physical uh, harm and, and, and in interference with, with, with one's freedom. Of, of, of speech, then harm became also emotional and, and, and social. And, and uh, uh, the, the, the FGM practice, for example, reflects a particular conception of what is harm to the human beings. Now, of course, that may clash with certain other practices, basically religious or cultural practices. And, and that, is, that is one of the problems of liberalism. The problem of liberalism is that it can cope with, it is designed to cope with fleeting 
majorities, with majorities that change all the time and not with fixed groups within whatever uh, uh, social setting it is. And it is the, the, the fixed groups that, 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 that create a problem, whether, whether, whether uh, within a liberal, so-called liberal society or, or outside it. Uh, uh, th there, there was a, f a phrase used by a political scientist in the 1960s, cross-cutting cleavages, that wherever you stand, you're not always opposed to the same people on, on issue, on the issue, say, of, 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 of religion or of environmentalism. You're not always confronting the same opposite group. You have, you have a, 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 a set of cross-cutting cleavages. So, so, so we may, uh, in, in, in issue a, or over issue A, I may constitute a temporary fleeting majority with a certain group. And on issue B, I will constitute a minority. But the, 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 the possibility of changing from being in a minority to being in majority is always there as, as our understanding of the issues change and also as the, as the social composition change. So it, it is the notion of fixity which, 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 of course, seems to me a major problem. And when you're talking about groups in India, you're almost exclusively talking about religious groups, right? There are other groups which are equally important, but yeah. they, 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 are, they are overwhelmed by the group called religion or by the groups that are religious. Uh, whereas in, 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 in so-called, let's call them West for the, for the sake of, 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 of shortcut, of shorthand, uh, 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 there, there, there are many groups, some of which are more important than religious groups, and there, there, there's always a, a, a change in the in the balance and a change in the weight and the intensity of which groups are important in the, at a particular point in time and in a particular area. So we have constant movement, and it is the 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 the, the challenge and also the the problem of liberalism to keep running with these changing circumstances and very often to trip and fall down. Uh, uh, and I, 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 counsel, I, I don't think that, that council culture actually comes from liberalism. It, it comes from a certain notion of, 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 of propriety, uh, uh, of, 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 of correct language, of political correctness, which is not liberal to begin with. Uh, it, 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 it comes from, from it, it has got some socialist left wing uh, 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 foundations. It's also got some uh, some highly conservative foundations. It's 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 a different melee. It's a different mix. Uh, uh, liberals have always felt uneasy with the notion of political correctness. But on the other hand, they are also very worried about harming people and our conception of what harm changes. So when in in in, in the late ninth in, in the in the early twentieth century, psychoanalytical understandings of human beings began to be become quite important, the notion of, of, of this kind of uh, emotional harm suddenly became much more prominent. And suddenly people said, oh, well, there are other considerations to take, uh, to take into account. And the, the, the prevention of harm is one of the most important liberal unspoken principles, but it's there all the time. Great. Um, I'm going to bring Helena in because I saw Helena shaking her head when I was saying something. But Akash, after that, I'm going to uh, ask you uh, to speak. Do you just want to respond briefly to what I said? And, and then we can ask Akash to speak and then bring them in. Because I do want to have a brief discussion uh, also about the whole question of individuals and individual rights and group rights, because that is in many ways at the heart of the, the, the proposition. And I don't think any of, as, as Helena said very, very uh, eloquently, uh, no one is denying the importance of individual rights uh, in any of the systems. And I don't, I've, I've read Shashi's book very carefully as well. I've, I've read Harshan Rajiv's book very carefully as well. And yes, uh, Harshan Rajiv mentioned individual rights um, in, in the title, but, but we'll come to that. So Helena, do you, just want to, do you just want to respond to what I said, if you would like to, um, about, um, you know, this whole thing of why somehow the practice, even in the context of the United States, if you would like to, why there is a feeling in any quarter that, there, that the practice of, of liberal politics somehow rides or, or encompasses um, chronic elements of appeasement of minority groups in ways that don't apply to the majority group 
howsoever one perceives what is minority and what is majority. Okay, well, I had some things to say about liberalism and populism. Yeah, sure, um, please go ahead. Surely, um, but because I really, I don't remember what I was <laughs> nodding about. Um, we clearly don't agree on, on everything. I, I, I am completely in agreement with what Michael just said. I think he stated it eloquently. I don't think cancel culture, political correctness is liberal, a, a part of liberalism. I think it's illiberal, frankly. So um, that's what I would say. It's an unfortunate thing that comes from, yeah, a certain left-wing socialism um, idea. It comes also from the right. It comes from fear of offending. Um, all sorts of things, but I wouldn't really associate it closely. Could I just say, could I just say by way of clarification, I agree with both of you completely that I think cancel culture is extremely liberal, but I did want to bring that uh, example in because it is something that finds itself functioning either within a matrix of a liberal order or passes off as liberalism or is perceived as part of liberalism and therefore causes the larger liberal uh, framework its own share of damage because it gets identified with hyper liberalism, if, if you will. Uh, so I agree with both of you completely, but I did want to bring that example in. But please go ahead and make your comment. My 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 point about about are we on the same? Um, no, no, no. You you were going to say what you want to say about? Populism? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so as you may know, I, I'm very much a historian and my book, um, The Lost History of Liberalism, tracks um, the history of liberalism where I really focus on uh, the word uh, liberalism as a kind of um, foundation for what I say and discuss what liberals themselves meant when they used the term and how this evolved over time. So when I speak of liberalism, I mean a cluster of ideas that kind of um, uh, crystallized in, uh, in or around 1813, which is when uh, the, the word was coined. And so in the wake of the French Revolution, and it was first theorized by people like Benjamin Constant. Benjamin Constant, which apparent, who apparently had, might have had some influence in India, actually, um, as Christopher Bailey sort of suggests, but that would be a really interesting thing to, to research. A anyway, um, in the context of early 19th century France, uh, liberalism meant uh, a commitment to the rule of law, to civic equality, to constitutional representative government, and the safeguarding of a number of rights, among which freedom of expression, freedom of the press, um, freedom of a religion were always on the top of the list, but also property rights. Um, and um, it was not uh, about democracy. Somebody like, um, like Benjamin Constant was not a Democrat. Uh, and, and very few of his uh, fellow liberals were. They, were, they did believe that power derived from the people, but the people did not always know what was best for, for them, or so they thought. It was quite elitist in that sense. They had seen um, crowd activity uh, during, the, um, during the revolution, how, how on numerous occasions the crowds had um, invaded the National Assembly or, and ex, uh, exerted direct pressure on legislatures. The most democratic uh, moment of the French Revolution was also the bloodiest revolution, uh, bloodiest period. Um, so they were uh, also, the whole notion of democracy was a bit vague at the time. There was different, it wasn't set and uh, many of them thought of it as direct democracy. Um, even a Tocqueville in Democracy of America uses the word like seven times or different ways, uh, actually. So this was a little problem. But democracy in its traditional meaning meant people power. And they were certainly not against direct people power, that kind of um, uh, exertion of, of power. They thought the people were unruly, irrational, prone to violence, unenlightened. And what you needed to pro properly uh, uh, um, participate in government to vote and to uh, be elected was capacity. Uh, and this was often uh, connected to property rights because it afforded you time and education to think about the common good, to think about something 
larger than they said. I mean, there are problems with this clearly, but this is basically what they said. After these, this, the most radical period of the French Revolution came Napoleon. And here again, we, they saw the gullibility of masses. Um, their, their, um, their, suscept their susceptibility to dictators and demagogues. Um, and they worried very uh, much about this. The demagogues like Napoleon, I'm saying, Napoleon I, who of course subverted everything liberals had fought so hard for. Um, and not that long afterwards, you have Napoleon III and they ruled by plebiscite, by appealing over the representative institutions directly to the people saying that they embody their will um, often take their countries to war to war, to distract them, to corrupt them, um, they would say. And while they line their own pockets and those of their friends and amass more power uh, by basically misleading the population, um, strong men. I don't think the word populism existed yet, but you can see how this related. They had words like Bonapartism and Caesarism, which meant pretty much the same thing. Um, so they were really, although an advocate of popular sovereignty, Constant was not a fan of democracy. And many people could, would say that liberalism, in fact, was invented to contain populism or, or to make democracy safe, uh, to in, put the safeguards in the constitutions that were such as individual rights, such as balance of power, such as freedom of expression, to make Napoleon's impossible. Uh, whether they succeeded uh, is, is um, obviously not so true. Um, but they also knew, and here I come to something else that's very important and that we've been touching on, is that these early liberals, uh, these founding fathers of liberalism knew that constitutions were not enough. Values were needed, morals were needed. And for this normally in that time, you, you look to religion, uh, but Catholicism uh, had not, was not to be trusted. I think most liberals, not all, it's very dangerous to make broad generalizations as we know, um, but, but Protestants are overrepresented massively in the liberal, in liberal parties, in the liberal tradition. Um, and many of them, if not most, uh, were very mistrustful of Catholicism. Catholicism, they thought, encouraged um, submissiveness to authority, the structure of, of, of the church. Um, uh, for example, it encouraged, again, I'm speaking for these liberals, um, it encouraged a kind of superstition, um, uh, an adherence to dogmas and rituals that did not, um, were not, uh, were not, reformable um, Catholicism um, and, and described by the popes across the 19th century was kind of static. It was not something that was going to reform itself from inside itself. On the other hand, they believed that Protestantism could, not all Protestants, there were some Orthodox Protestants who were very against liberalism, but a large part of these, these founding fathers, these liberals, many of them believed that Protestantism based on critical judgment, a certain idea of reading the Bible, um, a, an individualism was um, supportive of liberal democratic values and also Protestantisms, and they are liberal Protestants, um, uh, fewer rituals, fewer dogmas, more, more emphasis on moral behavior. They thought that all of this would be supportive of the liberal value, political values and the liberal constitution. And it was necessary. They're very worried about dissolution of social bonds after the French Revolution. They were very worried. It had been a group, if you want, divided country into groups, the clergy, the nobility, and everybody else. They had gotten rid of that with civil equality. How do you now bind these, and they talked about atomization, uh, how do you bind these people together? Well, you needed re religion, they would go to religion, but some religions were better than others. And they, most, and somebody like Benjamin Constant um, definitely favored Protestantism. And here I'm going to say something that might surprise some people and might, uh, might provoke debate. But I really believe that church and state, and it touches on the questions I asked you, I really believe that church and state separation and freedom of religion to someone like Benjamin Constant was a strategy to 
liberalize religion and to wean France and the rest, the Catholics elsewhere, off of their religion and make them more deist, have them embrace a more liberal religion, something that was more supportive of the values of citizenship. Um, and so it, it was for several reasons. First of all, they believe that liberal, uh, Protestantism was naturally self-reforming and there are, there are, there are uh, theologians I could point to who actually say this, that that's what God intended was for religion to reform itself. And some of these ideas, they might actually have gotten from Adam Smith, who in The Wealth of Nations speaks about how what we need is a competition of sects, like a free market in religion. Um, and because what's gonna happen is they're gonna compete with one another and create a more pure and a more rational religion. Um, so um, let me see, I will finish up with, shall we blame therefore populism on liberalism? Uh, does liberalism somehow lead to populism? Well, um, I think it's a betrayal of liberalism. And certainly my theorists, my uh, the, the, the best, the, the, all the people I speak about in my book who are not only theorists, but politicians and journalists and writers of all kinds, um, uh, would not be surprised by illiberal democracy, uh, by populism. <laughs> democracy was almost, it was democracy that could, could easily devolve into Caesarism or, or this kind of populism we talk about, the, the adoration of a authoritarian ruler who says that he embodies the people. Um, but um, it was, they were pragmatic and not dogmatic, I would say. So they also adjusted to the problems at hand. Uh, I think they were, as, as Michael said, it was changing, they're open to change. When the problems changed, they, many of them ad adapted. And if not, they ran into trouble with socialism, for example, when they didn't respond properly to workers, the problems of workers. As, as Michael has so um, eloquently uh, written about new liberalism, if the first liberals were concerned about establishing liberal democracy and the constitutions, individual rights, rule of law, this new group sees the problems uh, of caused by industrialization, um, urbanization, pauperism, the fact that workers are stuck in poverty and that they just cannot rise up through free markets, that they are stuck there. They then believe that governments should intervene and help them to raise them, to give them equal opportunity. So liberalism evolves and it's always contested. Liberals also, as Michael said, argue among themselves. It's not a dogma, it's something that uh, adapts. So um, I think um, about today, I'm, I'm a historian, so I get a little nervous about um, speaking about today, but I'm doing, I'm asked to talk about it more and more. So I'll say that I, I, I would venture to say that we need a new liberalism again. We need a new liberalism to deal with the problems of today, the massive inequalities caused by what many people call neoliberalism. Neo uh, globalization, the technological revolution that we are facing, automation, all of these huge problems, climate crisis, all of these problems, I think, require liberals and liberalism to reinvent itself once more. Um, and then finally, um, let's remember that it also has to do with values. It's not just about policy. It's not just about uh, constitutions and yeah, government policies, but towards the economy and so forth, but also about the values. And I do feel that we have failed there. Um, that's a, 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 a place where liberals have perhaps failed. Michael Sandel's book, The Tyranny of Merit, is very eloquent on this. I noticed that in the preamble to the to the Indian Constitution, um, that. Um, that Akash writes so beautifully about, there is mention of fraternity and dignity. Um, and I think that uh, Sandel uh, speaks about this, that, that there has been a backlash towards these social economic changes that are leaving people out, uh, that are causing status anxiety, that are causing people to feel in America, not just um, um, forgotten, but disdained in some way. Um, and that we need to restore a kind of um, a, 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 a discourse of respect for the dignity of work, for the dignity of, of all. And perhaps liberals have 
forgotten about this. I uh, I'm going to finish in a second. Um, but one uh, theme throughout my book is that liberalism was also really about liberal values, classically going all the way back to the Romans, liberal, the key, the root of the word was liber. And many people say that liber in Latin, we, we were reminded again and again means freedom, but it also meant generosity. It also referred to the values of a citizen, commitment to the common good. Um, so not nationalism yet, you need nations for it to be nationalism, but patriotism surely, the good kind of Cape patriotism, and I agree there wholeheartedly with the idea that patriotism can be a good thing and that there is a good kind of nationalism. We do need a binding ethos. Elites need to step up. Elites need to step up. We need more public, better public education. I believe we need civic education. I'm generally talking about America here um, since I don't know that much about India, but I would think that these values um, are necessary across the board. Okay. And perhaps we have forgot, we talk so much about rights, individual rights. Well, how about about obligations? How about um, loyalties to our fellow citizen? How, why aren't people speaking so much about that? Uh, so we need to inspire people again. Um, I'll stop. Okay, there. great. Thank I'll you very stop. much. Um, uh, I am, I'm going to bring Akash in, but before that, uh, Hel Helena has, has uh, very uh, usefully referred to Michael Sandel. What I'm going to do in the remaining 10 minutes or so that we do have, uh, that I'm going to read out a passage from Michael Sandel's book. It's called The Tyranny of uh, Merit. Uh, what be what's become of the common good? I should also say that Michael Sandel was invited to participate in this um, discussion. Um, it's important, and I want uh, particularly Harsh and Rajiv to listen to it because, and I'm reading it out after a lot of consideration, not because it is opposed to what you have suggested in your book, but because it talks about a scenario that is pot potentially a future scenario if one were to overemphasize on individual rights. Okay, I'm not even saying that you suggest an overemphasis on individual rights, but it talks about a scenario. It's a scenario entirely limited to the United States, uh, and it's a country that both of you have, for whatever period of time, lived in. Uh, I will uh, ask Akash to comment on, on, uh, on this as well. Uh, also, uh, the other thing is that Helena made an important point, which was that should should academics as well as practitioners, uh, because a lot of the practice of liberalism is not by academics, it's by politicians, it's by others, or is perceived to be so. Should liberalism or doesn't liberalism need to be redefined in light of a new scenario, as Helena suggested? Or should it be reclaimed? Should it be reconstituted? Brief answers from all of you. But let me read uh, from, this is from page 220. Uh, seven, which is actually the last page of Michael Sandel's book. If democracy is simply economics by other means, a matter of adding up our individual interests and preferences, then its fate does not depend on the moral bonds of citizens. This writes very closely, uh, Rajiv and Harsh, to, to the whole idea of civilization, state, and dharmic order that you talk about. A consumerist conception of democracy can do its limited work, whether we share a vibrant common life or inhabit privatized enclaves in the company of our own kind. But if the common good can be arrived at only by deliberating with our fellow citizens about the purposes and ends worthy of our political community, then democracy cannot be indifferent to the character of the common good, the, of the common life. It does not require perfect equality, but it does require that citizens from different walks of life encounter one another in common spaces and public places. For this is how we learn to negotiate and abide our differences. And this is how we come to care for the common good. The meritocratic conviction that people deserve whatever riches the market bestows on their talents makes solidarity an almost impossible project. So in light of this, I'm not taking sides. I just wanted to read it out to you, and it was useful that, that Helena mentioned it as well, is that what he is saying is that 
if you do go down a hyper-meritocracy, individual rights, et cetera, et cetera, this is one possible scenario, which is the, the, the community's solidarity and the cohesion and et cetera, et cetera, will, will, will disappear. And that is one of the reasons that the state has a role to play here, which need not be a socialist welfareist one, but, 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 but a role of certain sort and must take into account uh, the inherent differences, not just of merit and ability, but of identity and practice amongst its legal citizens. Um, Akash. Thank you, Nalanda. Um, now there's so many ideas at play here. I was really um, uh, inspired by a lot of what um, Professor Rosenblatt said, and I would always defer to her on liberalism, when you raise Sandal, I mean, the latest book I find very confusing because I don't understand the way that his thinking has evolved from this communitarianism to these elements of luck egalitarianism. So I, I won't say anything coherent about Sandal's work because I, I'm, I'm baffled by it. But um, if I can try to weave it back into this, to your earlier question and the way that that Professor Rosenblatt took off on the idea of liberalism and populism as, as antagonistic. Um, one thing I think we have not yet brought out is the way that, I mean, I wanted, let's, let's say, take a moment to defend populism, um, if I may. And, um, and just so Rajiv and Harsh don't think that I'm siding with them because we're a permanent antagonist. Um, uh, I, I think the kind of right libertarianism that you represent doesn't have much to do with, with uh, populism uh, as, um, as I'm using it now. But within this history of, of liberalism that, that Professor Rosenblatt had, had mentioned and, and um, Professor Frieden had also mentioned concepts like the rule of law and, um, and fidelity to institutions. So these institutions are of course from your very early question, Nilanjan, are uh, built into liberalism, at least into constitutional democracies, certain accommodations of minority protections through checks and balances, like the creation of somewhat anti-democratic institutions like a judiciary to protect uh, a minority from a tyranny of a majority and so on. So, so the, the, these, these uh, accommodations or appeasements to minorities is built into the very structure of of, uh, of liberal constitutional democracy. So there's nothing new about that. So what I'm intrigued by is what is new about populism that, um, uh, that makes it stand in distinction from nationalism. And, uh, and I don't think we've clarified it in, in any way the distinctions between nationalism and, and, and populism. And so what, what I think might be two of the aspects that are most important and why I want to defend populism uh, in a certain uh, way is the epistemic question that populism raises. So uh, uh, I don't think we've explicitly mentioned social media yet, but we have talked about new technologies. Um, and of course, the classical account that uh, these sorts of grassroots agitations arise because of, um, of uh, stagnant wages um, and uh, jobs being uh, shipped abroad and a, um, a fear of falling and all of these aspects. They, they, don't, they don't answer to the question of why it is, for example, that um, Black uh, women can be said or characterized were, have been characterized as saving the election in the United States, or why uh, the Dalit uh, communities can be said to, to save uh, liberal democracy and the fidelity to the constitution in India. So what you have is the most vulnerable groups in some way expressing the highest level of fidelity to institutions that they, that according to the theories about these uprisings um, uh, are, uh, are against them. So there, there are certain missing elements, missing components. And I think the missing component might be something that's come up that's very unique today, which is a sort of truth and determinacy. You know, that people were using this expression post, what was a post-truth uh, condition or something like that. I don't 
put much credence to that because that that has to assume a, a, a more widespread uh, uh, realization of enlightenment principles that that um, I don't think has empirically ever been uh, proven to be true. But uh, as a as opposed to post truth, there's a certain truth in determinacy, and and this is why social media. Um, and the new technologies is so central to populism today because these are the ways that that um, you know that mediate our access to the external world. And when you see populist rhetoric about the failure of institutions, the distrust in institutions, and most particularly um, the uh, the pretensions of the rule of law, so you know the constitution didn't, didn't change after Donald Trump came into office. The emoluments clause was always there. But from day one to the last day, he violated it, and yet there was no recourse, nothing to be done about it. The Hatch Act ha had been there from day one to the last day, and day after day, Americans saw the Hatch Act violated by uh, uh, the executive branch, and yet there was nothing to be done about it. So, in, so these rhetorical terms like rule of law have been um, uh, sort of shoved down the throats of, uh, of, of, uh, of the people. Uh, from this point of view, and this idea that institutions are the necessary mediation between government and, and the people. And these are the things that are being um, uh, challenged today. So the, 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 um, uh, the failure of institutions to protect or represent uh, people, the, um, the impossibility of understanding or having access to, uh, to the truth because of um, uh, uh, truth and determinacy that comes today, you know, as a as a as an intellectual, as a as a scholar, as an academic, I, I participate as as we all do in the production of knowledge, and we know the fallibility of that of that process. On the other side, I'm not a public figure like Shashi Tharoor, but anyone um, Shashi must know anyone who reads about themselves in the paper, and I've had this experience, sees how much of it is simply false. And so when every, every uh, mechanism that we have to access knowledge, um, even as elite, uh, uh, returns back to us the, the major fallibility and falseness of information in the public sphere, um, uh, imagine what it's like to be uh, uneducated or uh, 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 an average citizen. So this, um, this distinction, I think, between populism and liberalism has you know, to be separated from this triangulation with nationalism, and how do we distinguish nationalism and populism, obviously something new is unfolding. That something new, I think, has an epistemic dimension far more than it has even uh, a social, you know, in-grouping in and out-grouping, um, or, a, a, or a purely political uh, dimension. So I just wanted to bring this up because I think we've talked about so many things, but what is going on today is of peculiar character and that peculiarity must uh, be accounted for in, in certain ways that you know classical liberalism or classical nationalism don't uh, don't uh, accommodate. Sure, great, thanks. Um, there, 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 we could go on and on, but we've actually crossed two hours. I'm now going to ask Shashi and Harsh and Rajiv to make very brief concluding remarks, principally because. The three of them were very generous to agree to come on and so that we could use their books as case studies, as, as springboards to have this very, very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, there, are, there is a lot else to be discussed, including the historical moorings of, of the entire debate we've had in the context of India, as well as in, 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 in the outside context. Uh, but could I just begin with asking Harsh, could you all of you just please uh, keep your comments brief? I'm sorry to, be, to keep it brief, but please do. Thank you. Thank you, Nilanjan. I'll, I'll keep it very brief. I, I mean, just to quickly answer to Helena's question, is that a strategy to liberalize um, Islam? I mean, that's for people to decide. That could be the end result of it. I mean, just to add to her example about Catholicism being distrusted by you know, liberal Protestants in France, actually, from what I understand, she knows better that even the French Revolution allowed Jews to be individual French. They just did not allow them to be Jewish as a group in front of the state. And that does seem to be an analogy with the way Rajiv and I are talking about the Sharia law and the Muslim minority in India. 
and therefore the French, the French experience and the American experience both are much more about individual rights. There's a bit of a difference between laicite and liberal American secularism, uh, but this all definitely seem very, very different from India. And you know, uh, we speak about individual rights uh, to just oppose that against group rights. You're absolutely right, we need to speak about duties. But duties is more about a society. Duties is not about a state. No state can force duties. I mean, over and above whatever taxes you're supposed to pay. And what I fully agree with, I think the strands that Akash was talking about, uh, you know, where does the fraternity come from? Where does that individual dignity come from? And I think that fraternity is something that actually political liberalism seems to not have any answer for. And that has to come from some kind of social, cultural, religious backdrop. Now, in the Indian case, the caste system was very much uh, a result of historical economic feudalism, I would say. And just like there were small communities in France and Japan, very similar to Indian Dalits, in India, urbanization and capitalism seems to be absolutely degrading caste. I mean, it's happening in front of our eyes and therefore it seems slow, but in historical times, one or two generations is nothing uh, if the caste system goes because of capitalism in India in say two generations. So just to conclude, you know, about liberalism, there was something called a new left or a Frankfurt school in the 1960s and 70s. And they basically got in all these continental and postmodern ideas, um, which were not about individual rights, but about structural power differences, about groups and about oppressive structures in society. That has actually gone to American academia, what is known as woke culture, that what you guys call cancel culture. And now the French are complaining about that culture coming back to France, which ironically was produced by their own philosophers to some extent, people like Derrida, whether they admit it to or not. And there was an interesting article on this in the Financial Times. So to conclude, we strongly believe that individual rights is very much in consonance with dharma. I think dharma will expand beyond India because there's a complete collapse of belief in Christianity in the West, but that's a separate debate. And within that context, it is important to keep in mind that what Shashi point of view is basically it's defending orthodoxy and it's not defending the minority within minority and it is important to call that out because i think shashi as a writer and shashi as a politician are different and as a public he has to wear a different hat i i do think secretly he's much more in our side as he said intellectually he's sort of uniform civil code he's just not practically for it so i really don't know what that really means when it comes to the practice of it so rajiv i'll hand it over to you because i know nilanjan wants us to speak before uh, the Zoom conversation gets cancelled. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I have to give Shashi a chance to defend that statement. But, um, you know, uh, th thank you very much for your closing statements. I, I, I you know, as long as they're, they're absolutely your statements, whether the, the spread of, of dharma beyond India or whether woke culture and cancel culture are the same are all things that I think at the end of the conversation I can say to you I disagree with. But that doesn't mean that I do not respect that it is your view. Um, Rajiv, very briefly, please. I'm afraid Harsh yes. has taken up some share of your time. Sure. So, no, I just wanted to uh, uh, acknowledge the point that Professor Frieden made about liberalism always being an ideology under siege. So, the Indian uh, jurist Nani Palkiwala has uh, written about this and talked about this and very evocatively said that every generation has to fight to preserve freedom. So, uh, you know, he's not as well known as he should be outside India. So just wanted to flag that for you. And uh, I'll just pass it to Shashi by saying that uh, I love the agility with which he traverses uh, politics and the intellectual world, uh, no matter how sort of contrary they may be. And I hope he succeeds in bridging theory and practice and his politics and his prose. Thank, thank you very much, uh, everyone. And particularly, of course, to Professor Frieden and, and Professor Rosenblatt and Professor Akar Singh Rathor, who've all uh, given their time freely to these uh, three Indian authors. I just want to say that uh, on Harsha's point about laïcité, uh, indeed French laïcité is not the same as, as American secularism, it's not the same as what India called secularism, because India does not define secularism as involving distancing from religion, uh, as Nehru would have, but he was unusual in being agnostic. In India, secularism has been redefined to mean uh, encouraging a profusion of religions and for all of them to flourish without being particularly favored by or discriminated against by the state. That's why I preferred to use the word pluralism. I've been doing so for 30 years because that's the essence of the constitutional liberalism of India that allows people to be who they are and, and, and permits, encourages indeed, 
protects plural identities in the country, which sadly the majoritarian ethos has sought to erode. Uh, on other points, I think uh, we could go on disagreeing forever, but just on dharma, I should say in the lunch and I, I'm rather proud of the fact that 32 years ago, I became probably the first Indian writer in English to have a pretty long exposition of dharma, uh, both in my novel, The Great Indian Novel, it and did. in an afterword to it, which indeed points to 22 definitions uh, of, of what it can mean. So the point is that I don't think I have any difficulty in identifying with the civilizational aspects of India, including uh, the value of dharma, which was defined for me by a Muslim friend as simply being that by which we should live. And to my mind, that, that's perhaps the simplest definition. But let me just conclude by saying liberalism is indispensable. It is embedded in our constitution, attempts to make the constitution function in a way that the populists want a majoritarian way does undermine liberalism. And the better we acknowledge it conceptually in forums like this one, uh, I mean, the sooner we do it, the better, because we really do have to recognize that liberalism needs to be defended. And it needs to be defended in the name of every Indian citizen whose individual rights are threatened by this monolithic uh, majoritarianism that's being sought to be promoted in our country. I'll stop there, but thank you all, especially if we get cut off before formal thanks can be said. It's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Um, no, we, we won't. We still have that one minute, but could I please, please begin with thanking first our very, very loyal online audience, which has been there all through and has sent several comments and uh, uh, not some are not so complimentary, but that's fine. Um, uh, but, uh, but that is sure to happen. Uh, th that is a, a reality we all live with. I do also want to thank the three authors because from the very beginning when I decided to set this up and reach out to all of you differently, all mm -hmm. of you knew that the views that were going to be presented were going to be opposing views. So I'm very grateful because I do believe that these sorts of platforms are important. Um, you know, it is not a question of beginning to think alike. I think it is far more important that we all begin to think together. Uh, that is, and that is really the impetus behind why I put these panel discussions together. That is the reason why some um, of the titles of some of our events are intentionally provocative. Uh, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael Frieden. Thank you very much, Helena Rosenblatt. Thank you very much, Akash Rator, um, Rajiv Mantri, Harsh Madhusudan, Shashi Tharoor, all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you from LSE South Asia Center and good evening from London. Good night.